In this video, I'm going to show you how to control six strips of color LEDs with one Arduino by turning all 20 digital pins into analog outputs. Hey, what's up? I'm Trevor Makes, bringing you another tutorial on electrical and computer engineering. This time, I'll show you how I built the background lighting for my studio using cheap common anode LED strips. First, I'll explain how the LED strips are wired and what it takes to power them. Second, I'll talk about the Arduino's built-in timers and how to reconfigure them. And finally, I'll cover interrupt routines and how to use them for software-driven analog output. But first, let's take a closer look at the LED strips that I chose for this project. Each strip has four terminals, a shared 12-volt supply and separate return paths for green, red, and blue. The strip is laid out in segments of three LEDs each, connected in series. To turn on one of the color channels, the corresponding return path needs to be switched to the supply ground, thereby closing the circuit so current can flow. The same segments of three LEDs are repeated along the length of the strip, all connected in parallel. Between each segment is a line where the strip can be cut and the pads exposed for soldering wires in place. Depending on how long the strip is, and thus how many LEDs are in parallel, the return path can source quite a bit of current around 100 milliamps per channel per foot. So, additional transistors are needed to switch these to ground. I use ULN2003 Darlington arrays, which put seven open collector drivers into one chip. Each driver is rated for 500 milliamps and can be switched directly by digital outputs from the Arduino. For six separate LED strips, each with three color channels, that means I need 18 pins in total and three driver chips. The Arduino Nano has 20 digital I.O. pins, but two of those are used by the serial connection that I use for controlling the lights, which conveniently leaves exactly 18 pins for the LEDs. And here's what it looks like fully assembled. With the 12 volt power jack and the first two LED headers on this end, the other four LED headers on this end, and the USB mini jack on the side. To make the most of the LEDs though, I don't just want to turn them on and off. I want to be able to dim them so I can control the brightness and create a wider range of colors. Arduino's analog write function normally would be perfect for this, but only six specific pins are compatible with it, far short of the 18 pins that I want to use. So what's so special about those six pins, and is there another way to make the other pins act the same way? To answer that, We'll first need to understand pulse width modulation, or PWM. This is a trick for approximating an analog value with a digital pin that can only be set high or low. The secret is to flip the pin on and off really quickly and adjust the ratio of time that it stays high to low. The percentage of time that the pin stays high is called the duty cycle. It's just like toggling a light switch on and off to dim the lights in a room, but doing it quickly enough that you don't notice it flickering. If the light is only on half the time, a 50% duty cycle, it will effectively be half as bright. Arduino's analog write does hardware PWM using timers built into the microcontroller. These are special registers that count up or down independently of the CPU, either by some fraction of the CPU clock, called a prescaler, or by counting external events like an input pin changing state. In the case of PWM, the hardware timer is configured to set a particular output pin high when the counter is at zero, set the pin low when the counter reaches some target value, and then keeps counting until it hits the top and wraps back around to zero, starting the cycle over. By setting a target value closer to the top, the pin will stay high for longer, resulting in a larger duty cycle. The Arduino Nano has three of these hardware timers, and each timer can perform PWM on two particular pins at the same time. This makes up the six total pins that can be used with Arduino's analog write function. And unfortunately, the microcontroller is just hardwired for those six pins. However, the hardware timers can do more than just toggle pins. Another option is to have the timer generate interrupts. An interrupt asks the CPU to pause whatever code is currently running and instead jump to a special function called an interrupt service routine, or ISR. The ISR is free to do anything that would be normally done with code, including writing to an output pin, and when the function returns, the CPU goes ahead and resumes whatever code had been running before, as if nothing had happened. Technically, interrupts could be used with PWM mode, 
and the ISR could be used to toggle any pin instead of just the six hardwired ones. But this approach would still be limited to six total analog values because there are still only three timers and two interrupts per timer. Aside from PWM mode, the hardware timer can also be configured for clear on timer compare or CTC mode. In this mode, the timer counts up to the target value and generates an interrupt. But instead of continuing to count up to the top, as in PWM mode, it immediately resets or clears the count back to zero. This is useful if you just want to have an interrupt happen at some specific time or interval. But you can take it even further by having the ISR reconfigure the timer settings for the next interrupt. For example, the ISR could stop the count so that the interrupt will be a one-shot and not fire again until the timer is restarted. Or the ISR could adjust the target value so the interval between interrupts could be different each time. Using the latter idea, adjusting the interrupt interval with CTC mode, we can actually pull off PWM with any number of pins and only requiring a single timer. The trick is to pre-sort all of the pins by ascending duty cycle. For a simple example, let's say we have just two pins at 25% and 75%, and that our PWM cycle counts in four increments of 25% each. Initially, both pins are set high, and we look at the next event in the sorted list, which is 25%. That means that in one unit of time, we need to turn that pin off. So we set the timer to interrupt in one count. When the next ISR fires, we turn that pin off and look at the next event in the list, now 75%. We've already counted to 25%, so the next interrupt needs to happen in two counts. The next ISR fires at 75%, we turn the second pin off and look at the next event. But now the list is empty. However, we still need to count to 100% to make a full cycle, so we set the timer for one more count. Finally, at 100%, the next ISR then resets the pins and starts the cycle over. With that idea, the rest of the solution is just a matter of data structures and algorithms. I store the events in a fixed sized array that holds up to the total number of pins, plus one for the initial event that resets all the pins to their initial state. Each of these events keeps track of the current state of all pins as a bit field, plus the number of timer counts until the following event. When the ISR is triggered, the next event in the array is loaded, the bit field is written directly to the port registers that control the output pins, and the count for the next interrupt gets written to the timer register. To initialize the event array, which needs to be redone any time the LEDs change, each pin and its duty cycle are pushed into an empty array by insertion sort, using ascending duty cycles as the sort key. When pins with the same duty cycle are encountered, they get joined together into a single event that handles both pins at the same time. Pins with 0 and 100% duty cycle are a special case and instead get rolled into the first event, the one that sets the initial state for all pins, since in both cases the pin is either always on or always off. Once the timer and events are initialized, the whole PWM cycle is totally self-sufficient and continues to run independently of the main program, just like with analog write and hardware PWM. Whenever an output pin needs to change state, the ISR takes control over the CPU and updates the registers, and then the main program resumes as if nothing had happened. In fact, interrupt-driven PWM will continue to work even if the main program gets stuck in an infinite loop. Which gave me an interesting idea. If the main program were put into a tight loop that just turns a particular pin on and off as fast as possible, and we were to connect that pin to an oscilloscope, then we'd be able to observe when an ISR is running and measure how long it takes, just by looking at the gaps where the pin stops toggling. Here, the pins are set with duty cycles 1 through 18, so there are 19 ISRs total, including the initial event that sets all the pins high. Since all of the duty cycles are set one step apart, the interval between them represents a single timer count, which is configured to be 16 microseconds. Most of the ISRs take around 7.6 microseconds, but the last ISR in a cycle takes around 10.3 since it does extra work to reset the event queue. This adds up to a total of 148 microseconds of interrupts in one PWM cycle. However, the whole cycle takes place over 4,080 microseconds, so it's only taking up 3.6% of CPU time overall. And that's only in the worst case. 
If any pins share the same duty cycle or are set to zero or 100%, there will be fewer ISRs and it'll take even less CPU time. Well, that's it for what I'd like to cover in this video. There are still a ton of details that I left out, but if you'd like to dig deeper or get the schematics to build the project yourself, all the code and documentation is available on GitHub, and you can find the link in the description down below. If you liked the video, please click over here to subscribe and see more. If you'd like to learn about a totally different approach to analog output using a DAC, check out my other video over here. And if you'd like to learn more about the basics of Arduino hardware PWM, you can also check out this video over here. Anyway, thanks for watching, and I'll catch you next time.